Madeline Loy is the Noxious Weed Coordinator for Skagit County. In her work with the Noxious Weed Control Board, she is responsible for inspecting noxious weeds and working with public and private landowners to ensure that noxious weeds identified are controlled or eradicated as outlined in RCW Title 17, Chapter 10, Section 140. Her prior work with Clark Public Utilities Environmental Services Department centered around riparian restoration, including invasive plant control in the Salmon Creek and East Fork Lewis River watersheds in Clark County, Washington. Awesome. Thank you, Nathan. Um, so I'm the uh, Noxious Weed Coordinator for Skagit County, and I know that uh, pretty much everyone on the call today is probably pretty well aware of uh, how obnoxious and costly noxious weed control can be. Um, so today I'll be discussing ways to increase the effectiveness and kind of limit cost of noxious weed control in our local landscape. Um, beginning with why and how we manage noxious weeds in the first place, um, how those pieces fit into the puzzle, early detection rapid response or EDRR, uh, some of those priority species for EDRR here in the Skagit River watershed, and a uh, local example of EDRR. So uh, beginning with why, why manage noxious weeds in the first place? Uh, the, the more boring answer, of course, is that it's legally required for many uh, Class A and B and C noxious weeds. Uh, the more impactful answer, of course, though, is that uh, noxious weeds harm our natural resources, including soil, water, wildlife habitat, forestry, and agriculture. Uh, without the kind of pressures that are uh, present in the home ranges of these invasive species, uh, they outcompete our native or desirable plants often forming monocultures that offer less resources to the ecosystem. We also know that some noxious weeds can transform their environment, making conditions more favorable for further infestation and less desirable for native plant recovery. Several noxious weeds can even increase soil erosion or better retain soil. Um, it can even change soil chemistry. Uh, let me see if I can get a laser pointer here. Um, this species here in the upper right hand corner, uh, I think Laurel maybe is on the call. I appreciate you uh, sharing your, your photo through the State Weed Board website. Um, this is a species garlic mustard that has an allelopathic chemical that acts almost like an herbicide to help it, uh, you know, outcompete the, the forbs that we would normally see in a healthy forest ecosystem. Uh, over a long enough period of time though, this can even stifle forest regeneration. Since our native vegetation serves such important functions in the riparian ecosystems, failing to address noxious weeds undermines uh, our riparian efforts or our restoration efforts in these areas. Um, I also wanted to kind of uh, point attention to the fact that noxious weeds really thrive and are spread uh, or introduced in the first place by disturbance events. Uh, these can certainly be pretty well human controlled situations like land clearing or moving dirt or material. Um, but these can also be, you know, kind of almost completely out of our control, such as in occasions like fire and flooding. Uh, the thing that all of these events have in common, of course, is that they open up space for novel plants to move in and actually encourage germination of those seeds that are lying dormant in the soil. Uh, since the riparian area is kind of predicated on transition and uh, flooding and flowing waters, we can expect to see disturbance. Therefore, we can anticipate and plan to deal with noxious weeds in these areas. That's where our integrated weed management plans come in. IW IWM or IPM is a, a concept that many of us are very familiar with and are doing essentially all the time. Um, but to review, uh, an integrated weed management plan is kind of roughly defined as the use of the most appropriate control strategies, uh, but also has 
elements of prevention, monitoring, planning, and evaluation in addition to that control uh, portion. A successful integrated weed management plan is realistic and sustainable. Um, you know, taking into account the resources that we have at our disposal and the follow-up that'll be needed. Integrated pest management or integrated weed management um, also needs to be kind of uh, science-backed or kind of have that, uh, you know, selected to, uh, I guess, have the least cost to both our pocketbooks and the environment. And some of the resources that can really help with that are available through your County Noxious Weed Board. Uh, also, the wanted to just kind of name out a few. The Washington State Noxious Weed Control Board website has uh, some great uh, identification and control tips. The WSU Integrated Weed Control Project is kind of the go-to resource for biological control agents, if those all are appropriate. Um, and if chemical control is appropriate, the Pacific Northwest Weed Management Handbook has uh, great recommendations of herbicides and rates that have been tried and, and found to be effective on um, whatever weed. Beyond that, uh, the herbicide label will kind of help you narrow down what the what the correct uh, timing and sites are for for that type of control. An integrated weed management plan again is going to be we'll kind of use multiple strategies from the the spectrum of control um, and will not be a one and done solution. I just kind of wanted to underline that failing to return to follow up or invest in sufficient site prep in the first place can you really put you behind the curve and cost more in the long run. Elements of an integrated weed management plan include prevention, which we'll discuss in the next few slides. Monitoring, a lot of our, our sites um, and, and agencies are already doing monitoring, um, and this can kind of be pivoted into um, an EDRR system, as we'll talk about in a few slides again, uh, as long as those doing, doing the site visits are trained and able to kind of convey data that they're collecting out in, in the field. Um, establishing thresholds and, and targets goals. Um, treatment, again, uh, using kind of those four pillars, uh, using a variety of methods that are gonna be appropriate for uh, the weed, the site, and the, the life cycle of the plant. Um, so those, you know, of course, include uh, mechanical or manual, so mowing, pulling, um, cultural, uh, burning, covering, for example, biological and chemical. And again, it'll, it'll probably be a combination of those things. Um, and then evaluation, um, you know, always uh, improving. And then the, the cycle continues. Um, so when, when we're referring to noxious weeds, of course, we're uh, kind of using that legal definition of, of noxious weed for harmful non-native invasive species that have been accepted to the Washington State noxious weed list. From there, the class B and C weeds are selected for control based on the county. Um, but I do want to kind of mention, as we're talking about the lists here, two more uh, list, lists at the state level to be aware of. The first is for the, this first is a monitor list for those plants that we suspect to be invasive, but the state board hasn't yet had enough data or support to list them. Um, and the second is the plant quarantine or prohibited plant list. Um, that list uh, has many noxious weeds on it, as well as plants that haven't yet been introduced to Washington as a preventative method or preventative measure to keep those plants out of the state in the first place. So I've, I've already mentioned classes. I uh, just kind of wanted to refresh those. Uh, these are based on distribution. So those class A noxious weeds uh, like egg leaf spurge here in, in the top photo. Uh, these are those that are most limited in distribution. So those are the ones that are only impacting a few counties in Washington state. And in those counties, the, the I guess, infestation level is still pretty low. Eradication is required for those, meaning that um, all plants need to be removed because that's the most feasible. Class B noxious weeds are those uh, like in the photo here, hybrid or bohemian knotweed. Those are ones that are pretty limited in some areas and very widespread in others. I know a lot of us here on the west side, you know, see this species in our sleep, um, but it really hasn't done uh, quite as much on, on the east side of the state. So control may or may not be required depending on where you are. 
Um, and then class C noxious weeds are those that are like Canada thistle here that are essentially everywhere. Um, control is only required for those species if selected by the County Noxious Weed Board. All right, and I wanted to introduce um, just a general invasive species curve or general invasion curve. Um, so this has, uh, you know, species introduction. We'll discuss these kind of action thresholds in the next few slides. Um, but I, I just kind of wanted to take a quick look at this uh, and, and in an effort to illustrate that after an infestation occurs, we're kind of at a race against time to uh, get to that species before it starts becoming established and eventually spreading. Um, eventually those plants are spreading and we kind of reach that exponential growth where uh, control costs become very costly and it becomes more established, meaning that it's uh, going to be, again, covering a lot more ground and is going to be a lot harder to, uh, you know, completely eliminate. Uh, and then eventually even to, to control is going to be a challenge. So, you know, of course, the first step, ideally prevention. Uh, there's kind of two routes to introduction. So uh, prevention kind of looks at limiting both of those routes. The first is through deliberate planting. Uh, so this is, you know, you think of escaped ornamentals, but there have certainly been um, a lot of really well-intentioned plantings, uh, either for aesthetic value or for other perceived benefits where um, these plants have been deliberately planted and have escaped containment. Of course, the prohibited plant list is an effort to try to reduce this. However, the prohibited plant list can't necessarily stop every single landscape ornamental from um, being traded or, uh, you know, some of those species still entering landscapes and then uh, expanding. Um, certainly landscape dumping still, still happens, especially in kind of wooded areas, natural areas. Um, so that's definitely one route to be aware of. Uh, the other route is through accidental plantings. So that's uh, pretty common when materials, dirt, uh, gravel, hay are moved from a site that is infested to a site that's not infested. If there's seed or other propagated plant materials in that, um, then it can very quickly establish to the new site. Um, another thing for our groups to be aware of is gear and equipment. Mowers, boots, uh, we'll discuss a couple of species today that can, can spread very effectively through uh, just a pretty small amount of mud on gear or equipment. So um, kind of a best practice to get into, especially if you're working in areas uh, that, that some of these species are present in, um, is to, you know, brush your, brush your boots and gear, get off any big chunks of mud um, before getting in the truck, before leaving the site. Um, and for equipment, you know, hosing it down in an area that it won't be introduced to a new site. Um, and for boats, remembering to clean, drain, dry. Uh, so once an infestation has happened, this is uh, kind of the, the point where uh, a new plant has emerged at a new site. Uh, eradication is feasible. And what we mean by that is the complete elimin elimination of the noxious weed from that area. Again, this is not going to be appropriate for all noxious weeds. You know, some species that have become too established, eradication is going to be way too resource intensive um, to be successful. And, you know, kind of at that point, our goal switches to containment or control. Um, eradication, though, is certainly a cost saving measure because if we're able to get to it early and completely eliminate it, then that's one more species that we don't have to be going back to year after year. Um, however, I do want to mention that. A uh, pretty hefty monitoring program is still required even after eradication may be achieved. In this photo here, we have uh, a couple of our 2023 seasonal noxious weed aids uh, assisting with a modern, or I guess a survey of an eradicated site um, for this particular project. Um, it's Spartina Control and our project defines eradication as six negative surveys over at least three years. Um, but we still revisit these sites since there are still plants that could return um, from other sites in the county in the greater Puget Sound area. And then kind of the next level of infestation, containment or control is the appropriate action. Uh, what we mean by containment or control is to stop it from spreading. This is to protect those areas that haven't yet become infested and to 
create space to protect those resources, um, such as riparian areas, infrastructure, um, and other kind of crucial, crucial areas. Again, this is going to be uh, for for weeds that are most recently uh, infested, the that heightened requirement of eradication is more appropriate because it'll, you know, essentially be a cost saving measure down the line. Um, but for those species that haven't yet become so widespread all over the place, um, containment or control is required um, to essentially protect uh, those unfested areas and to, um, you know, protect those assets that are are in those areas. Kind of the next step following containment or control is long-term management. Think species like Himalayan blackberry that feel like they're all over the place that we will never have, you know, completely eliminated from an area, but that we do need to address and, uh, you know, carve out space for uh, those important ecosystems in our riparian restoration projects uh, to protect, you know, personal property and to protect um, infrastructure like roads, uh, including roadside visibility and safety. So early detection and rapid response, again, is coordinated set of actions that's essentially part uh, monitoring and finding these species and part uh, contingency plans for what happens if we do find them. EDRR is, I guess, not a replacement for an integrated weed management plan, but ideally is part of your weed management plan. Um, and I know that sometimes these acronyms can sound very expensive. Ideally, it's, uh, you know, just kind of a, a way of, of uh, being a little bit more prepared in your integrated weed management plan. A lot of these steps that we're going to talk about, your, your agencies or organizations are already doing. Um, just with, you know, a few more resources and trainings, we can, you know, really save a lot of costs in identifying some of these key species early. Um, and being able to kind of plan and act quickly to uh, reduce them, hopefully uh, eradicating them or at least containing them to specific areas. So of course, preparedness is gonna be a, a step present in each of these components of early detection and rapid response. Looking here at this uh, screenshot map, this is a screenshot from the early detection and distribution mapping system, edmaps.org. Um, for flowering rush. This is a species that we'll talk about uh, in, a, in a few slides here. Um, essentially, this, another, uh, another great resource if you're looking at kind of the, the planning and analyzing risk side of things is the WSDA's distribution maps. This can kind of help you understand where these species are. Um, I think this uh, EdMaps is a great resource because you can kind of see where they're being spotted. Um, and kind of over time, you can notice some species creeping west. Uh, this, this species is definitely one of those, um, is now kind of becoming established in the uh, Columbia River watershed and has a, a CWMA group there now, or a cooperative weed management area there now, um, is also present uh, in Whatcom County. Uh, looking at this particular species, um, you know, is spread by plant material. Uh, this kind of sets off a little bit of a red flag in my mind, since I know that uh, Silver Lake has a public boat launch and uh, several of our lakes also have public boat launches. We may see this species within the next decade um, and should be prepared to, to see it and to act quickly if we do. At this kind of at the preparedness step, we can be inventorying the tools and resources that are available to us. Um, and, and those that we can leverage very quickly if we do spy a new uh, species emerging in our areas and in early detection. So monitoring is a big part of this. Again, a lot of your organizations are already doing this monitoring step, especially if you have stewards or stewardship visits. As long as the people going out to the site are trained and able to identify uh, new and emerging species, and are able to collect data and report and verify what they're finding. Um, so if you have uh, protocols already for um, collecting via field maps, iForm, um, other, other uh, apps, that's great. Um, if not, I'd love to help you get connected to EdMaps, uh, a free citizen science-based app that uh, can help those doing the surveys um, collect you know, photos, other, uh, crucial data to be able to verify that what they're what they have found is in fact the species that they think it is, um, and then can help kind of 
share that with other land managers. The next step is rapid assessment. So again, kind of uh, communication, coordination. This is kind of the, the point where we use that data that we've now collected to plan the appropriate spawn response. Um, you know, at, at this stage, we're going to be assessing whether we're going to need to uh, get a hold of additional funds or permits if we need to reach out to landowners in the area. Um, and then, of course, a rapid response. So prioritize actions that you can take quickly and that will be appropriate for the site and the life stage. We'll discuss this photo in the um, or the example in this photo a bit more at the end. Um, but I just kind of wanted to point out that uh, when when this plant was identified, uh, it was it was bolting, which means that herbicide was no longer an option. And we were kind of at a race against time to get a hold of these species before those seed hit the seed bank. The Skagit Land Trust was able to motivate uh, and kind of gather their volunteers in the area very quickly to collect those that were bolting um, so that, you know, saving all those seeds from escaping. Uh, and then, of course, your rapid response should be sustainable because, again, integrated weed management is never really all one and done. So we'll need to you know, kind of assess uh, if you're able to continue and sustain this level of labor at the site, if we need to create kind of a, a slightly different plan, depending on the resources and follow up that'll be available. Um, also, again, just to kind of mention that uh, reports and communication coordination with partners is a great idea, especially uh, to help ensure that the torch doesn't get dropped on eradication uh, in a new infestation like this. So I have a short list of species here that uh, I've kind of highlighted as some EDRR species in the riparian areas in the Skagit River watershed. Uh, some of these are already present in the area, others are not yet. And I, you know, kind of want to stress that this is not an extensive list and I don't have a crystal ball. So we could certainly see other species coming in in the near future. Uh, so if you suspect that you're seeing a novel noxious weed, or just one that you aren't sure how to address, I'm happy to collaborate and I encourage you to reach out. Our first species here, garlic mustard. Um, I have mentioned it a couple times, but this is one that is present in Skagit County. Uh, we know of essentially two populations. Uh, this is a very high priority to eradicate. It's a biennial plant. So in its first year, it'll, it'll look like a rosette. Um, or it'll be in its rosette stage. It has these kind of kidney-shaped leaves with rough edges, green to black stems. Um, and if you pull it up, you'll see a white taproot that kind of has an L or S shape. In its second year, it will bolt and get these kind of more spade-shaped leaves. It'll have that uh, stereotypical cruciferous, you know, four-petal cross-shaped flower and seed pods. There are a couple of lookalike species that I want to mention. Uh, native plants, ground ivy looks a lot like it. Um, it'll have, uh, you know, runners along the ground. Um, but piggyback plant and fringe cup, I've also seen uh, misidentified for it. And those are awesome native plants. So we want to make sure uh, not to accidentally get those in the crossfire. As I'd mentioned kind of earlier, garlic mustard has an allelopathic chemical uh, which helps it, uh, you know, helps give it a, a leg up on the competition, um, helps it quickly take over a forest floor. And again, this is a, a species that you're going to find in forest understory. Um, so partial to dense canopy, it really can't be shaded out. If you're finding small investigations, you could certainly hand pull it. Um, you'll just want to make sure to bag it so that those any, you know, seed heads on it don't get the chance to uh, hit the ground. And if you're finding uh, a larger area, if you're able to get to it while it's in this rosette stage or even better seedling stage, um, you could use a glyphosate-based uh, herbicide and follow up. Um, this part's really crucial to follow up to hand pull any that uh, make it to flowering because it's not unlikely that some will get by you. This is kind of only known in, in two areas in Skagit County right now, one off of South Skagit Highway and one just south of Cedar Woolley. So if you're working in these areas, I would highly recommend, um, please, please be very careful um, about moving equipment and gear on and off the site. 
uh, just kind of getting in the habit of, of cleaning our boots and uh, cleaning our equipment before getting to new sites will really, really help us with this species. Uh, oh, I also wanted to mention um, in Skagit County, we have received a small grant for the from the state. So we'll we're able to offer a little bit of assistance um, to to landowners kind of struggling with this species that we can uh, that we can find in the next year here. Uh, the next species is giant hogweed. This is another class A noxious weed that is currently present in Skagit County. It's toxic to humans and some animals. Um, kind of a greater concern than its toxicity, though, is the uh, phototoxic sap. This is that one that you see the horrible, horrible um, burns and blisters. It causes extreme sensitivity to light. Um, but it's equally concerning to the environment. Uh, it grows in these uh, riparian areas and is just a, an early grower and takes up a huge amount of space. It's very competitive and, you know, really makes native plants more sparse. This increases soil erosion, um, which, you know, just again, monopolizing that space gets worse and worse. This is a sometimes biennial, but mainly perennial in, in our area. Uh, spreads primarily by seed, but also vegetatively. Um, so if you're finding the species, we're needing to address both the seeds and the, the root of the plant. Um, small plants can be dug up uh, if that's feasible. If you're finding it at the rosette stage or kind of this uh, vegetative stage, um, foliar herbicide treatments uh, are, are certainly effective. If you're finding it at this bolt stage, um, the primary thing is going to be uh, controlling those flowering heads, keeping it from going to seed. Um, if it's, you know, too large to be doing foliar spray, uh, injection and cut stump have also been effective. So uh, I would encourage you to reach out to your Noxious Weed Control Board um, or me to uh, kind of brainstorm some ideas that will be appropriate for that particular plant. Um, I do want to mention too that there are some lookalikes for giant hogweed, uh, primarily cow parsnip. This is also a phototoxic plant, so it would be a good idea to have sleeves and gloves uh, anytime you're handling a plant that looks like this. I've also seen uh, Devil's Club and Western Colt's Foot misidentified as giant hogweed, but those will have, uh, you know, simple palmate leaves where cow parsnip and giant hogweed will have that uh, dissected leaf. So that's kind of a good, a good way to tell. Um, again, cow parsnip and giant hogweed can be really difficult to differentiate from each other. The primary ways to tell them apart are the size. Uh, giant hogweed is going to cap out at eight to 20 feet, which is a very large plant, um, and cow parsnip will be between three and seven feet. Um, the leaves are also, will also be a lot more serrated or, or deeply toothed uh, compared to cow parsnip, but I'll, I'll be honest with you, I can convince myself that any cow parsnip is giant hogweed if I look at it for long enough, so um, my cheat is to keep a, a photo of both on my phone and, and compare and contrast to each other to know which one I have for sure. This is another species that we only knew of two populations, one on Fidalgo Island and one just kind of south of Cedar Woolley. Um, so especially if you're in those areas, you may see it, but um, that can certainly pop up in other areas in the watershed as well. Egg leaf spurge, another class A noxious weed that is found in Skagit County, pretty, but is very uncommon. This is an upright perennial that stands about three feet tall. It has egg-shaped leaves, um, however, I think that the, the leaves are more oblong than they are egg-shaped, but it certainly is more egg-shaped than uh, its close relative leafy spurge. Um, both are class A, or one is class B, but both are very uncommon in Skagit County, so we definitely want to find and control, actually eradicate both if, if any are found. Um, these are very toxic to humans and animals. They have a kind of a milky white sap that uh, can be very irritating to the skin. So again, you want to be handling this plant with gloves and sleeves on. For uh, egg leaf or leafy spurge, uh, if you find a small infestation, uh, you could dig it up. Pulling it won't be effective uh, since it is perennial. 
there are chemical options um, that, that will work against it, but if it's a large infestation, we'll probably need to do a combination of, of tilling or mowing and then um, spraying new growth. Uh, this, again, chemical options um, can be kind of limited depending on what type of site you're on. So this would be a great one to reach out to your weed board to brainstorm kind of the best path forward. In Sketch County, again, um, this, this is known in two areas, one on uh, Fidalgo Island and one West Mount Vernon. However, I have seen uh, reports of egg leaf spurge also up around Diablo, so it could be within the Skagit River system. This next plant, Flowering Rush, is one that is a Class A noxious weed not yet present in Skagit County. I hope it is never present in Skagit County, um, but this is one that that thrives in lakes and slow moving freshwater streams. Uh, it's, it sounds like it's extremely difficult to control. So it's one that uh, I, you know, really want to prioritize uh, early detection on. It can grow emergent or submerged in water up to, I've seen reports of six to nine feet. Uh, it has triangular leaves, which can be a little bit tricky uh, since, you know, we have a lot of sedges that will be growing in kind of a similar area. Uh, this will be a lot more triangular shaped stem cross section than a lot of our uh, native sedges will be. They'll, they'll be a lot more flat. Um, if you're able to dig them up, uh, they also will have kind of a, um, you know, rhizomal root masses. I guess the easiest way to identify it is probably by its flowers. However, uh, they, they don't flower very often, you know, only for a part of the year. And the species that's uh, growing in in Whatcom County is uh, considered, you know, the sterile triploid version. So they'll be flowering even less frequently. Um, so we likely can't rely on that. Um, they, you know, kind of are perennial. They spread by roots and create a monotypic shoreline habitat that is uh, pretty destructive for, of course, um, those that use the shoreline habitat. Hairy willow herb. This is going to look very similar to fireweed. Let's see, I've got fireweed to compare it to. Um, fireweed will mainly be flowering just on the terminal end, um, where hairy willow herb will be uh, kind of interspersed with leaves. Um, fireweed will have alternate leaves, leaves and hairy willow herb will be opposite. Um, currently, it's only known on Fidalgo Island in Skagit County, um, but it is in surrounding counties um, and could certainly be within the Skagit River system. Um, and finally, common reed. Uh, this is another one that we don't yet know of in Skagit County, um, but that is in surrounding areas and certainly could um, come up. There's, uh, it's a perennial that kind of creates large clonal areas of, of this grass. Um, it has kind of plume-like flower structures like pompous grass, but uh, instead of, you know, kind of the thin grass blades that pompous grass does, it has a more of a reed-like structure with uh, those really wide leaf blades. There is a native variety of common reed. So if you uh, suspect that you're seeing it, it'd be a great idea to reach out, although the native variety is very uncommon. Um, and then just kind of to wrap up, um, wanted to share a story. This is definitely not the only example of early detection and rapid response that we've had uh, recently here in Gadget County. Um, but in, so when I, I guess, uh, stepped into my role in late fall of 22, um, we'd kind of been looking at maps and trying to identify some of those sites where our high priority species are present. Um, one of those species, of course, was garlic mustard on the South Skagit Highway. Um, we'd gone out and done some initial survey and I I'd, I'd looked at some of the uh, lands that were potentially impacted in the area. I reached out to um, Kayla Seaforth with the Skagit Land Trust and kind of wanted to give her a shout out. Um, we had gotten together and did kind of a, a practice survey. Um, I'd collected some samples so that she could get the hang of identifying them and, and kind of seeing them. Um, we discussed kind of where we could expect to see it growing and uh, what to do if we ever do find it. Um, we didn't find any in our practice survey, but that was not the last time that Kayla saw this plant. Um, 
So within the month, Kayla was out at another site and spotted garlic mustard. Again, the, the garlic mustard that she found was bolting at that time. So herbicide was no longer a tool available to us. Um, and I kind of wanted to just uh, share this example because it was a great, uh, it was a great example of preparedness. Um, they, she'd been out doing these stewardship visits in the area. Um, she knew what she was looking for and uh, very quickly reached out to confirm that that's what she had identified um, and to kind of brainstorm a plan. Um, she, she knew that she had an awesome volunteer base to reach out to and was able to mobilize them um, to collect uh, a large amount of, clearly <laughs> demonstrated by those bags, a, a large amount of um, bolting garlic mustard that would have dumped a lot of seed into the soil. Um, so certainly uh, well-demonstrated preparedness, early detection, rapid assessment, and rapid response. And we were able to offer uh, some assistance in um, reaching out to landowners, uh, technical assistance, and we're able to obtain a small amount of funding to help uh, landowners in that area get connected to resources that they need to, um, you know, apply the level of control needed to uh, eradicate this population. So, uh, and that's all I've got. Um, I have my contact information here as well as our website. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. And again, if you're, if you're dealing with any uh, novel species or species that you're not sure quite how to address um, or would like making kind of contingency plans for what to do if we find these weeds in our area, um, I would love to help. Okay, so we've got, uh, would you be able to list the resources you mentioned on the integrated weed management slide? Um, yeah, certainly. I can, uh, can everybody see chat if I type it there? I've been curious at the effectiveness of the boot brushes that are available at trail hubs of some hikes. Do you happen to know how much, how much those get used uh, and if they have been useful in limiting invasives on the trail? Uh, is there any worry that boots would pick up and spread invasives from that brush since theoretically that has seeds on and around it? Um, so I, you know, I should have probably collected some of that, <laughs> that data before coming in here, but um, there, there have been some studies that, uh, um, you know, kind of do highlight their effectiveness and um, I guess justify the cost. Uh, I know I've, I've spoken again, i Laurel, I'm calling you out a couple times because I'm most of my weedy wisdom comes from you. It seems like um, that you know, as long as those boot brush are being maintained, they get used. Um, that you know, if they are pretty dirty and gross, they don't get used so much. Also, ideally, they'll they'll be clean. Um, the idea is that you know you're you're leaving behind the dirt that would be carrying them. Um, as much as you know, there are very small seeds. Uh, if you're if you're getting rid of the you know, kind of chunks of mud and dirt. Um, those are really what's harboring a lot of seeds. Um, so as long as those boot brushes are getting, you know, cleaned out every once in a while, um, they they work pretty well. And then kind of the other nice thing is that if anything does end up um, getting established, it's going to be there where, where someone's going to be kind of constantly visiting. Uh, did that map just show garlic mustard in the Sauk River, Skagit River Delta? Um, there is garlic mustard on uh, kind of within the Skagit River floodplain. It's not, uh, you know, kind of within the aquatic area, but it is certainly within the Skagit River floodplain, unfortunately. Um, I see cow parsnip can also have red coloration, especially in sunny exposed site, but the pattern is a little different. Yes, I um, I know that that, that little uh, identification guide has uh, kind of calls out that red coloration. I think that that's a little bit less reliable since it can, uh, cow parsnip can be red, can have some red um, coloration on the stem. So I don't think that's quite as helpful of an identification tool. Um, we found a single stock up in New Halem over the summer, giant, oh, giant hogweed. Um, yeah, that is really disappointing to hear, um, but it that is a species that really thrives in riparian areas. I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Great, great question. Why is herbicide no longer an option once the plant is bolting? So for um, for biennials like like garlic mustard um, or, you know, uh, I guess some other. Maybe the biennials are kind of the main one that we refer to as bolting. 
Um, once they're bolting, essentially they are going to seed and then they're dying anyway. Um, so if you're, if you're spraying them at the point where they're already flowering, um, it's essentially kind of doing what the plant is already going to be doing, um, kind of getting to them when they are in that rosette stage, uh, you know, essentially it has the time to work and to kill the plant before it has the chance to, um, to set seed. Um, essentially, you know, it, it, you need a little bit of time for that herbicide to, to be effective. Um, it's not as effective when the, the plant isn't growing and, and moving sugars around. Um, and so it's essentially just, you know, kind of uh, targeting it at a life stage where it's already kind of um, past the point where, where killing it's going to be an option. Nice success story. Thank you for sharing the knowledge. Yeah, I know that, um, again, that's, Certainly not the only EDRR success story in the area, but I thought that was a um, a great example. And I'm sorry that Kayla wasn't able to to share it with us today, but um, I really, you know, want to want to give her and her team kudos.